2022 operating budget work session. Dr. Lockhart. Thank you, Ms. Herbert. Good evening, board members. Tonight, our budget work session uh, is really part of an iterative process. We're not making any final decisions this evening, uh, but we are reviewing uh, our funding uh, from the county as well as the state unrestricted funding. We're going to reiterate what we've uh, brought to you previously in terms of uh, our spending plan. And then we also kind of knew this year because of the uniqueness of this year is just again reviewing um, those one time funds um, through different sources that are available to us. Um, so we'll take some time to, to walk through those pieces. I'll remind you that uh, the county budget, they have a, uh, Commissioner Weaver's here with us. Uh, there's a county budget hearing, public hearing next week. Um, we also uh, will approve our budget uh, at a later, later date, a future board meeting um, as part of that process. But tonight again is really just about sort of fleshing out again uh, where we are uh, what lies ahead and getting clarification on anything that, that we may need. So with that, I'm going to ask Mr. Hartlove uh, to take us through. Uh, we have some brief slides and, and we'll, uh, we'll go through the process that way. Chris. Good evening, board members, Commissioner Weaver. Uh, we'll get started here on the overview. Um, so uh, the overview uh, the, of the items we're going to go over tonight is the, f the first three bullets are, are fairly uh, 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 typical for the, uh, this work session. We're talking about the unrestricted budget here. Uh, we're talking about county funding, state unrestricted funding, and how we're going to spend those dollars. Um, as the superintendent said in his opening remarks, this year's a little different with the pandemic and the, uh, the, the federal government's response to that. And it's uh, something that we want to um, talk about the um, how we're how the dollars that we're getting from the federal government and how we're going to utilize um, those dollars. So, So that's kind of the overview of where we're going to uh, to be tonight. We talk about other sources, uh, fund balance. We'll talk a little bit about that. Blueprint funding from the state, and then the federal one-time funding. We'll spend quite a bit of time on that. Next slide, Bob. So we're uh, starting with county funding, and you can one more forward. So our largest source of funding. Uh, for Carroll County Public Schools is the county government uh, by far. It's the large, large, largest source that we have. Uh, the, in, in the current year, fiscal year 21, we are receiving uh, 198.4 million from the county. Uh, the Board of Education, we've requested um, an additional uh, 11.4 million or a 5.73% increase. And the logic behind this was uh, a return to the pre-pandemic plan. This, this would put us exactly where we would have been pre-pandemic. Uh, as of right now, the way uh, the, where, where we sit is the, the county has their proposed plan in place for us, and that would be an increase of 6.2 million or 3.13%. So that's Kind of where we sit today, we have our request and also what's currently in the county's proposed budget. Next slide, Bob. State unrestricted funding, second largest source of funding, and you can pursue one more forward. So the difference between county funding and state funding is that state funding is a formula. So uh, this year, due to the pandemic, we did lose enrollment. We believe that's a temporary uh, loss of enrollment. But nonetheless, uh, the governor came through for us this year with a, with a hold harmless that we very much appreciate. That hold harmless uh, uh, guaranteed everyone approximately a $100,000, at minimum of a $100,000 increase and as you can see there we're up uh, 
approximately a hundred thousand dollars, which we would say we're flat because in the in the, in the grand scheme of things, that's less than a tenth of a percent increase from the state, but certainly better than what it it, it could have could have been. So we're very thankful for that that hold harmless. Um, so uh, next slide, please. So those are our main revenue increases, and as you can see, the main uh, source of spent of uh, revenue for us uh, increase for us is county revenue. Um, next slide, please. So, how are we going to utilize those those dollars? Uh, the number one item in our budget is uh, competitive salaries for our em our employees. That continues to be a focus. Six point two million doesn't take us real far, but we're going to do as much as we can with that. And uh, we have uh, uh, collective bargaining is underway, and that is that remains our number one uh, focus uh, for this year. Go Mr. Herbert, if I may, I just wanted to add a comment there real quick. <clears throat> I just want to remind folks of the, um, of, the, of the size we're talking about here, um, because $6.2 million is a, is a lot of money, and we're very appreciative for that. Um, but we are the, we're the county's largest employer. Um, we employ thousands of folks. They do great work for us. And so um, when Chris says $6.2 million doesn't go very far with us with compensation, I don't want people to think we're not thankful for um, additional dollars. Um, but I use this uh, with the Board of County Commissioners during the, uh, uh, the agency hearing. Um, when you look at the scale of our, our system, um, when he says that doesn't go very far, the example is if we were just give everybody a, a step increase, a step is a modest scale increase it's not a cost of living adjustment it's it's not a stipend or anything like that it's just what's built into our contracts with our with our associations it costs us approximately 5.2 million dollars just to do the kind of minimal thing that we like to try to do every year the minimal um and so i just wanted to sort of clarify what he was saying there that's why compensation ultimately very very important to us we want to be competitive we want to um we want to be marketable. Um, we want to attract and retain uh, the best employees we can. Um, but I just wanted to clarify sort of the scale we're talking about here. Because while $6.2 million is a lot of money, when you apply it to a big organization with thousands of employees, you, you can only stretch that so far um, across the entire system um, in ways that can be as impactful as possible. Sorry to interrupt. Just one. No, that. no, and I appreciate that uh, clarification because I certainly we are very you know thankful for what we're we're receiving. I think uh, you know just to further on that point, with half of our revenue not growing at all, that's kind of uh, kind of the the problem. Half of our revenue is growing at a at a, at a reasonable uh, amount, but the other half is is flat. So that's that's a pro problematic if we're trying to do more than just a minimal salary increase. The other two items that we're we're looking at, uh, they're smaller in comparison, but that is uh, reclassing some special education teachers from 10 to 11 months. That's gonna help uh, with the uh, compensatory services that are required coming up over the next several years. Um, and also, uh, we want to align our budget on uh, for instructional resources to meet the uh, uh, needs to support uh, student academic achievement in the classroom. Next slide, please. So that's kind of the the big picture of where we stand on our on our non restricted budget. Another uh, smaller item uh, relative to the rest of the budget is our utilization of fund balance. So uh, next slide, please. So just a, a, an update on where we stand. Uh, last year we added nine positions to the budget uh, supported by uh, CCPS fund balance. We are, uh, this budget continues to fund those same nine positions utilizing fund balance um, uh, for one more year. And I'll also just throw in another reminder. I don't, I'm not trying to lengthen the meeting here, but <laughs> um, <clears throat> if you remember, these were, these were roles that we deemed through a, you know, a process that we've taken to look at what our needs are in the system that were important to us. And, and my gosh, especially health, safety, and technology over this last year. I don't know what we've done without these positions. 
but the reason they're in fund balance is because we weren't able to, and we understand with, with last year in the p pandemic and all the uncertainties of, of budgeting, what was gonna happen. Uh, we were anticipating additional dollars last year. We didn't get that, but again, understanding what, what uh, you know, all that uncertainty that it brought. That's why we went to fund balance to use these because we said we, we've got to get these things in place to support our students and our teachers and our system. And uh, that's, that's why they're here. I'd like, I'd love for them to be an ongoing part of our, our budgeting process, but I just wanted to clarify for, for really for the, the listening community that why'd you put them in one time dollars? Well, because we didn't really have a choice. Otherwise we wouldn't have had them. And I can't imagine not having these important roles this past year, particularly. Dr. Lockhart, I mean, that, that was really because of the situation with the pandemic, right? We knew that it, we were taking a $5 million cut last year, like to the MOE level, right? And, but we knew that we needed these positions. So it was the, the way that we had kind of worked that out, right? So, but eventually we expect these dollars to roll into ongoing, or at least we hope we're in a position that they roll into ongoing. That's correct. Okay, uh, next slide, please. In fact, you can go over two slides, actually. Thanks, Bob. Uh, so now state blueprint funding, and this is separate from the other funding that we're receiving from uh, the state of, uh, of Maryland. This is, uh, these are dollars that are for specific items, and there's two items here. One is a supplemental uh, pre-kindergarten grant, which is we're receiving an additional $180,825. We're going to utilize those funds to expand our pre-kindergarten program. Um, we're also receiving an additional 1.6 million. These dollars are very similar to the uh, federal dollars that we're get getting uh, that we'll talk about in a moment, and they're going to be used uh, specifically to respond to the pandemic recovery, those types of things, and you'll see the details of those in a moment. So those are two items of, of, of state funding that are not being utilized for um, general things. They are very specific in what, what we, we're, we need to do with those, funding, those funds. Next slide. Actually, you can jump to the one after that. So uh, very good news here. Um, we had, there were some competitive dollars out there that were available. They're federal dollars that, that, that flowed through to the state. And that uh, GEAR funding, that stand, stands for Governor's Emergency Education Relief Funds. We uh, applied and were successful in getting an, an additional million dollars. It was competitive, so there was no guarantee. Um, and uh, Ms. McCausland is here to answer any questions regarding those, that, that process. Um, certainly was a, it was a cooperative effort with many staff in our, in our system. Those funds are specifically for student mental health and well-being. We're expanding our uh, sources of strength program. It also increases uh, the availability of behavioral support for students in experiencing uh, trauma related to the pandemic. I'd really like to thank our, our staff for seeking these things out and being aggressive in trying to secure them. This is a great example of that, where a grant existed for certain purposes and the team quickly pulled together. And as you can imagine, a lot of these things are flying this year, very quickly, quick turnaround times and uh, and there's a lot of uh, work that goes behind making that happen. And th these will have benefits. I've shared these with the, this, this particular one with the board. These will have benefits uh, for, for students in our system. But we're, we're always looking for additional ways in which we can bring those resources and bring those. So we're, we're trying to look outside in different, in different avenues. When we see grants and opportunities like this, um, we're, we're trying to take advantage. And I thank the team for, for making that happen. And Dr. Dorsey. May I just ask, I mean, we may have said it before, I'm not sure, but the sources of strength programs, by how much are we expanding that? I mean, how many more schools are we going to be going into? That's okay. If you want to come currently back. It's, currently, it's in several middle schools and several high schools. Um, it looks like this will be trainings and recertifications will occur throughout the duration of the grant, which is three years. Um, we'll focus on the new school rolling um, that will begin next year. 
Um, but I'm not sure. It does not specifically state. I think I actually had that in the write-up I sent to you all. I'll, mm -hmm. I'll find it. I, okay. There was a number of, of schools that expanded to. And I can meet with Mr. Rodriguez. Yeah. Okay. But the, the grant overall is significant. It's a million dollars, so it's significant in, in, yeah. in, in scope. Um, next slide, please. So on to the funding that is uh, uh, specifically uh, aimed towards uh, from the federal government and specifically aimed towards uh, recovery. Um, the, you'll see some of the detail behind that in a moment. With these funds, um, and they, we're not getting them in two fiscal year lumps. We're getting it in an overall lump, but it's we can we can spend those dollars over two fiscal years, and that is our plan to utilize those over two fiscal years. And our focus, as you'll see, is on learning recovery, improving academic outcomes, and supporting students' education and mental health needs. You'll also see that we are um, using some of the funds to help us bridge to Kerwin funding. We know that that's happening next fiscal year. So some of these things we can get a head start on utilizing these one-time funding, knowing funds, knowing that we have uh, a continuing source of funding coming in a year and being phased in over, a, uh, over multiple years. Uh, I will point out that this is uh, we're very preliminary on on the numbers that we have here, and also we don't know all of the the restrictions that are involved. These are these all come under restricted funding, meaning that you don't get the dollars to do whatever you want. You get the dollars for very specific uh, uh, things. So we don't even really know all this, the 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 restrictions at this point in time. But our goal, as as always, is to be, maximize the utilization of these funds. Make sure that we use all of them. And we use all of them effectively towards our our, our um, strategic goals over the next couple of years, in in specifically responding to the pandemic. And Mr. Hartlove, um, I know we brought up last month. You'll be giving us then a monthly report on expenditures. Expenditures. Well, we yes, the the monthly report that we that we we currently give you we'll, that will expand out and it will include these dollars. Right. Um, and there is quite a bit of accountability with any federal dollars. So there's there's audit uh, uh, there's audit restriction there's audit uh, uh, that that's, that are done on on these funds. Uh, so there's quite a bit of, of oversight. But we will also be including these in the monthly uh, financial report to the board. And I appreciate that because I think some people think we're getting all these millions of dollars, and we can do anything with them. And there is so many restricted dollars. And I just want to make sure that. Uh, the public can see where this money is being spent and that a lot of it is restricted. So I just want us to be accountable and transparent. Right. Thank and, you. Oh, uh, no problem. And, and uh, certainly they, they're clear that these are because of the pandemic and, and, and the problems that the pandemic has caused for us and having and trying to kind of dig out of, of the pandemic. OK, uh, next next slide, please. So. Starting to talk about uh, some of the, the dollar amounts, and uh, as you can see, we have two large uh, uh, pools of dollars that we're receiving. Um, both ESSER, which just for so everybody knows what it means, ESSER is Elementary Secondary School Emergency Relief um, Funding. The ACT is actually the Corona Response Relief Supplemental Appropriation. And the other, uh, the ARP, is the American Rescue Plan. These are all f federal dollars that are coming to us for us to respond to the pandemic. Um, and then we're also going to receive some smaller, well, they're, they're not small, they're you know, maybe a million dollars uh, of other smaller grants. But uh, relative to these two, they're, they're smaller. Um, we'll be receiving, uh, getting more information on these over the coming months. Um, but they will all be included in the budget that we approve in May. Next slide, please. I'm sorry. Um, oh, sure. Mr. Hartlove, can we go into just a little bit more detail on those? Do we have any idea what type of restrictions will be applied to those? Uh, we, we have some idea. Um, the ESSER 2 we've had longer, so we had know more about ESSER 2 than we do ESSER 3 at this point. But you know, where they're coming from is, is they want these dollars to be used in schools for students that have uh, a, a, a because of the result, because of the pandemic, they want to bring things, you know, make up the lost ground, the lost time for those students. That's really what the focus of these dollars is. And as you'll see, actually, we were on that slide now. 
the the items that we are we're looking at you know there's a theme here they're all first of all they're all one time in 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 nature you know we're, we're, these are not uh programs that are going to necessarily in this capacity continue on beyond the two years they may continue on in a smaller capacity but um they're all geared towards learning recovery um, as you can see, we have uh, the first three bullets are basically the same thing. There are three different programs. There's a summer, fall, and spring. But these are all extra learning opportunities for students to make up lost ground. Um, and certainly we have folks here who can answer specific questions about, about these. And I think we also have a, next week we have a, 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 a presentation on, on the recovery for this summer. I well, believe. that'll be an update on an update. recovery. Right. We miss, I think. Ms. Savini, you have more? Oh, I just had a, a quick question about the computing devices for elementary school and middle school, this six and a half million dollar expenditure. I know that from some of the first wave of federal dollars that we received, that's how we were able to get one to one for high school students. Correct. Would this actually get us to a one to one for all students? I think uh, Ms. McCabe can. It'll get us to one to one um, in grades three through 12. Three through 12, okay. And the uh, school out, the Schoology rollout, that is actually something that uh, started pre-pandemic, and it's something that we're glad we had in place for the pandemic because it was very helpful. But this is just a continuation of something that certainly helps with recovery efforts, but it's something that we, we're, we're utilizing, we'll be utilizing beyond the, uh, the pandemic. Dr. Lockhart, you had your card up. Um, you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hold. I think it'll be more appropriate later. I've okay. changed my mind. Thank you. Um, and, I do have one question. Sure. Um, how are we, um, I know this is, I was just curious about learning recovery. I know we have a lot of educators signed up. How are we doing with students? So I think we're doing pretty well. I'm not well. off topic. I just want to know because I was just curious about ratio. You, you will get an update at next okay. Wednesday's board meeting because that's a topic there. <laughs> I know as of Monday, we had over a thousand um, students already up confirmed they're coming that did not include <coughs> that does that's separate from special education compensatory services right. um, we still have not heard from about 55 percent of our students so a lot of right. uh, are in parents so a lot of schools are now going back reissuing invitations making phone calls doing that we've only had a handful of declinations so we we haven't had that many people say i'm not coming so I think, I think uh, maybe by next Wednesday, I'll have a, a more updated number for you, but we're over 1,000 just with, just with our general education students, not including our special education students I, yet. This is just such a good opportunity for them to uh, make up their learning loss. Thank you. And you'll see the last bullet there is learning recovery for 23. That's there just to, to uh, indicate that we will be continuing this into the next fiscal year as well reason it's a to be determined be, is because we really want to evaluate how we do this first year see what we learn see what the uh, what the enrollment is see you know what kind of progress we make and then we'll certainly probably this time next year be developing that program for the following year following summer next slide please so this is an important slide and it's something I want to be very you know careful on how I say this we are utilizing some of these fun funds for uh, new positions but the important the important point here is is that most of these are temporary some of them will uh, continue or be modified or eliminated as we uh, evaluate needs and results um, and as the Kerwin funding is phased in so what, what I'm saying here is, is we have this opportunity we're utilizing. You'll see some of the, the positions that we're talking about. We're going to utilize th these funds. The, the, many of the positions you see are temporary in nature. The others, we're going to utilize Kerwin funding to uh, utilize this funding to bridge us to, to Kerwin to uh, keep the positions for, for good. So next slide, please. So uh, on this slide, we have temp these are all temporary positions. And uh, the superintendent, uh, I believe, talked about these uh, earlier. Uh, we have, um, in the current year, we, you, we uh, had some positions that we utilized on a temporary basis to get us through the staffing for the year, to look at class sizes, 
Um, they really helped us get through and be able to deliver uh, uh, education uh, in person. We're, we want to utilize these funds to extend this for another year or two. Ultimately, these positions will phase, will phase out uh, as the funding phases out. So it's something we're kind of already doing, we are already doing, and we would like to utilize these, funding, these, these funds to extend it for another uh, couple of years. Dr. Locker. So if I may, Chris, sure. thank you. So <clears throat> this is, to me, this is the perfect time to utilize these funds, kind of like we, we did when I was talking about the, um, the health position, the school security position, the, um, the uh, mental health, um, the technology positions. We need to support our students. We do not need to have giant class sizes next year when we can use one-time funds to, to support keeping more resources, more human resources available to our students. Um, this is not a forever um, inclusion, but this also, I think, adds to the totality of why we requested what we requested um, in terms of a budget moving forward, because we have needs. Um, but we're gonna take advantage of the federal one-time funding um, to keep some of these folks in place that we brought on this year to help support students. We'll continue to look at that. There might be some places, as Chris mentioned, where we say, hey, we'll continue to roll this through and look at how Kerwin dollars might help us do that. Uh, there might be some places where we'll say that's not needed anymore, um, and we'll evaluate that as we go. But these are all focused in the schools, in the classrooms with students. Ms. Zavigny. Um, and, and Dr. Lockhart, I appreciate that. I just want to make sure that we keep our eye on the, the temporary nature of these, right? These are really from the federal one-time funding. This is not um, funds that are coming from the county or from the state. Um, and th these were additional positions that we had hired to get us through the pandemic, right? When we had issues with getting teachers and students back in person and quarantining issues and leave issues and all of that. This was kind of like a bridge to help us get through that time. So I want to make sure that, you know, th those don't just kind of automatically roll into headcount. These are very much a temporary look at those positions. That is correct. Well, we definitely need this because it's boots on the ground and uh, we don't need people in here. We need people out there in the classrooms. Uh, and uh, try to get uh, our per our student numbers down per per teacher. Dr. Dorsey, did no, you no. Say something? well, I was just going to comment. Even with the number of FTEs we see here, when we think of the number of elementary schools, the number of classrooms, the number of middle schools, the number of classrooms, and again, I I hear that you're really basing it on wherever the needs are at the time is where we. Um, send these um, temporary position folks to? Or? Yes, um, I've worked with uh, Steve Wernick, uh, who's here, at, to, to look at each of the elementary and middle schools and determine where the needs are. Um, it, it works out to, um, you know, the average is approximately one extra teacher per school. Okay. But, um, you know, there are some cases where um, a school needed two and another school didn't need any, um, but on the average about one per school. Okay. Um, and, and these are teachers that will lower class sizes and, um, and basically help with um, teachers needing to have kids make a lot more progress in the course of one year next year than they would normally have to make. And it's difficult enough to have a student at the elementary and middle level make one year's growth in one year with the rigorous standards that we have now. So um, next year is gonna be um, a very rigorous year for our, both our teachers and our students and I think these positions will really help. And I guess the point I was making again, and thanks for clarifying that, is again, even with these numbers, you know, we still have a lot of need out there. Um, it's great to hear that one additional person might be placed in a building, but I'm sure in some cases, as you said, um, even more need um, is there. Yeah. Ms. Savigny? Uh, I think my question is handled on the next slide. So okay. I'll hold. Um, but I will say one thing. <clears throat> we are getting students back, uh, and everyone needs to know that. And uh, uh, as I said before, in my granddaughter's elementary classes, uh, they're only missing two, and I know in middle school they are coming back. Uh, we have been uh, we've been very fortunate 
we we uh, put everything to the test and we were positive and we trudged through all this. But we have our we have seen an increase in our students, especially when we opened up four days a week. I think everybody was just tiptoeing, and I understand people were still scared. But uh, we have had an increase in our enrollment, so I just want everyone to also know that. Mr. Kyler. That's what I was going to say. We also had an increase. Some of the homeschool kids are coming back yeah. also. Mm -hmm. we, we've got more, less during virtual, more during face-to-face, -face, but we also have returning students. Yes. Not new, <clears throat> and, yes. and some new ones. Probably. Yes, we have. The, Ms. Savigny. Yeah, I was just going to tie that to the earlier discussion that we had in the year regarding enrollment and, you know, when we were doing enrollment projections. So at that time, we knew we had lost about 700 students, yep, right, Dr. Over, Lockhart? A little over 700, yeah. And we were trying to figure out, okay, in the enrollment projections for future years and how that would impact funding and, and space around the county and things. Um, we had we were struggling with what was our assumption going to be, and we had, a, we had agreed to assume about how we would get half of those kids back, but it right. turns out they're actually coming back at a greater pace than that. Is that not right, Dr. Lockhart? They are. I'm confident we're going to meet the half coming back and more. Um, right. So, yes. So and, that's, that's and, very positive. And we're at close to 80% of our student body is back in the, the buildings in, four days a week in, in person? person in the, yes. Okay. Okay, next slide. So um, another uh, group of positions, uh, these are tied to uh, the virtual uh, program. And these are positions that we will certainly reevaluate depending on, we, we really, do, when it comes to the virtual program, um, we're not sure what the uh, enrollment is, is ultimately going to be. So, um, but to start the program, we are looking at quite a few instructional assistants uh, for, uh, to act as uh, virtual success coaches, 15. And then we also have some uh, instructional assistants, lab assistants, 13 total, um, and the, as well as eight uh, teachers at the elementary level. The board members, you're going to get a presentation next week, um, a, a report, Mr. Uh, Bricka, Ms. McCabe, on our plans for virtual instruction next year. Um, and you'll get the whole soup to nuts, um, what that looks like, what that involves. Some of this is a little bit of guesswork. I anticipate um, that you know there's going to be. Um, I, I don't have a crystal ball, so we're not exactly sure um, what the number of students or the number of staff completely are going to be um, involved. It's kind of like summer recovery. We're trying to take our best estimate and doing that, and so we're we're putting some some of our best thinking here, uh, but this really is sort of an estimate. Um, uh, but again, without seeing that um, whole program, I know that's, I'm sure you have questions. So, like I said, uh, that is part of next week's regular meeting agenda where we're going to walk through all that. Yeah, I was going to say, I have, I have a lot of questions in that direction, but I'll hold until next week. Right. So. Mr. Kyler. I have just one simple question. All of this means, and I know you don't have the crystal ball, no one in the system is going to have to teach face to face and virtual at the same time. That is correct. We have shared, I think we shared it back in February that yes. we have every intention to be five days a week. We are not going to be uh, doing the model uh, that was in place this year where concurrent teaching occurred. So our teachers will be teaching five days a week in the classroom to the students in front of them. Next week, we'll be talking to you about a small uh, virtual offering opportunity, and that will be separate. Um, from five days a week of what happens in the classroom. Thank you for saying that very explicitly. Yep. <laughs> that was my goal, Weaver. Mr. Weaver. Uh, just one question on that. Are you going to have maybe some classes that would be taught virtually between the schools? Is that a, anything that's part of this? Right. So one of the things that we had been working <laughs> on pre-pandemic were some of our virtual programming opportunities. Cindy, did you just, I mean, Briefly. So the answer is yes, oh, okay. but that's different than all virtual or yeah. all in person. Um, we were looking at um, increasing the opportunities for students. Maybe they couldn't get a course at their home school um, that wasn't offered there, but it's offered in the county and they could take that virtually. 
which they're probably in person attending school and for one mod they go to a, a learning lab and take the course online um, as opposed to this is very different. Um, Cindy, anything to add there? But that, that pretty much, yep. Okay. That's great, great yep. thinking. So the overall concept of this is more virtual across the county, right? So you'd have a couple of virtual elementary classes and a couple of right. virtual middle school classes across the county. Correct. Okay. Next slide. Oh, great. Okay, with that, if you go to the next slide, it's actually just for questions and discussions. Basically, what we've covered is the entire budget, a very summarized level, but that's the unrestricted budget, the restricted budget, every uh, every plan that we have at this point with the preliminary revenue items that we know of um, today so you'll see something when we go to uh approve our ultimate budget it will be similar to this you know unless we get additional funding it will it'll be very similar to this unless we hear significant feedback today about a change that you'd like to make comments Ms. Savigny. Um, I just wanted to make one comment about overall, you know, on, on that first slide, you saw that our, our requested increase to the county was 5.73%, that that isn't really a significant increase over what we had previously discussed, right? It's, it's basically just getting us back to what had been agreed upon pre-pandemic, right? Because we had um, plans from a strategic planning perspective of what we were trying to achieve, and it was basically just trying to get us back to that position. We had to take a lot of actions last year, right? Dr. Lockard, you had that lay, that outlined in some of those um, positions that were being funded out of one-time money because we knew that even though we, you know, you, we, we took MOE last year because of so much uncertainty with the pandemic, but there were certain positions that we knew we had to fund given the situation, right? So, so that's kind of put us in a a bit of a predicament, um, which is why we're, we're going back to requesting what had been agreed to pre-pandemic. Um, and we, we think that it's reasonable given the fact that the county wasn't really hit quite as hard by the pandemic as they were originally expecting. Um, but I also wanted to say that if we were able to get some of that additional funding, it, it's certainly the commitment of this board, I think, I, and, and maybe I'll, I'll, I'll ask around, but that any of those additional funds would go directly to employee compensation. I mean, it, it, that, that we, we're, we're committed to that as a board, correct? Okay. I, I appreciate you saying that, Ms. Savigny. You know, our employees um, have done an incredible job this year across the board, all of our employees uh, making things happen. And you heard me uh, try to clarify some of uh, Chris's, uh, you know, big numbers what that means for a large organization um, in terms of you know thousands of employees um, and so yes we I appreciate that that uh, that uh, conversation as it relates to additional dollars toward compensation for our employees I think that's very important mr. Weaver uh, I think the board needs a little bit of explanation on this from the commissioners at this point um, you know this year well you know it's been a quite a crazy year as far as the way things have evolved. We were faced this year also with a budget that we weren't sure how it was going to come out. Uh, we did get a significant amount of one-time funding uh, to come in, but one time, is, as you're seeing here, doesn't do a whole lot of good. It, give, it gives you a quick fix or a Band-Aid, but what are you going to do when it runs out or a grant when it runs out? You either have to be prepared to absorb it into your budget or get rid of it. And we were also faced with some other issues that I'm not sure is uh, quite as public, uh, landfill issues for one, uh, that we took $25 million and put into of one-time funds in order to help solve some of our problems there. That's gonna be something we run into in the next 10, 15, maybe 20 years that is going to impact all of us. Uh, you know, everybody takes their trash, puts it in a can, it's gone, they're happy with it. But we're responsible now, where, where's, that, where's that trash going and what's gonna happen? Our general fund is going from two million to three million as what we put each year into fund that enterprise fund for the landfill. Now, by taking one-time money and hopefully opening up cell four and doing some other things with it, uh, that will eliminate, give us two million more per year to deal with uh, from those funds. 
We're also faced with a lot of infrastructure that we've robbed from from years here uh, in the past, uh, roads, uh, pipes underneath the roads, all the things people don't even see. But, you know, if, if one fails, we hear about it right away. Plus, Piney Run, we still have an issue down there with the water supply, and we're trying to get that fixed. Uh, and here again, we have some one-time funds maybe we can put together to fix the uh, dam and uh, overflows down there. And we're using it for a lot of things that we, we've let go a little bit, and we have to try to catch up some. Well, uh, we also have fire, police, and education the three main things in the county to keep this county going, keep it strong. We're undertaking the new uh, Carroll County Fire Department. Uh, we've hired a director, and uh, Chief McCoy is doing a great job here of trying to take our 14 independent fire departments and blending them with a somewhat of a paid AMS service. Uh, but we're at the end of our rope. We don't have much choice. We've been asked for years by the independent fire police, fire departments to do something they all operate independently they raise their funds we give a little bit of money to their volunteer association they take that divvy it out to help pay for ems service and they said we don't have volunteers we can't keep it up people are going to start not not responding to uh, ems calls to fire calls in any timely manner so the county was faced we either have to do something or people may die from it so we had to put some money into our two or into our fire departments and we have a rollout plan over the next five, six years, and that's a little bit flexible, but we're starting with uh, Freedom and Westminster this year. And the county will take over sixty new employees probably as EMS uh, people and or HR and the other things we have to deal with it. Uh, we'll also be buying, I think, those ambulance, uh, ambulances from them so they'll be county-owned uh, in that area. And as we roll out two companies a year uh, for the next few years, or it changes up as the years get up there, we will be able to cover EMS service for about 80% of the staff in the next couple or, of people it needs in about the next uh, couple years. It's an expensive proposition. Presently, we spend $13 million to CC Visa. Frederick County, I think, is $57 million. Baltimore County is $115 million uh, for that service. It's going to hit us, and it's going to hit us hard. We also had the police department that we were, they took over in 2010. And we have some deputies, and we have a police department that does a great job. And I, I can't emphasize enough what our SROs do in the school system. I've actually seen kids run up and hug their SRO, introduce them to their parents. True community policing. I mean, I, I can't think of a, a better way for a police officer to get to know the community than through the kids. And they are open to this. And I will give Sheriff DeWeese credit. He matched his SROs with the communities of what they need. And those officers have done great. I saw it here last month with the uh, saving of a life at Century. So that one. Then we have education, and our teachers have done a phenomenal job. And you guys opened schools back up. I was a little apprehensive about how that was going to go, but Mr. Collar, it has worked. I'll give you. I shouldn't say that in public, but uh, <laughs> uh, it has worked fairly very well here. And uh, uh, the kids are learning. I think it's it's what they needed at this time. And hopefully, we are on the right track. If we continue with these masks and things, we'll be moving along. Uh, and I know, uh, Ms. Vigny, you'd asked for the extra $5 million uh, three or four months ago coming into it. We discussed it. We looked at it. Right now, we just don't have it in ongoing money. If it, in one-time money, we'll see where we go. We have some more funding coming in in October. It's federal funds, and I don't know the, how the strings are attached. We really don't have a clear-cut picture on it. Some of it's going to be for infrastructure, and that includes fiber, and sewer and water. And I expressed to Mr. Hill here earlier that we're finally probably going to get some fiber up into his area. Uh, as he retires, we'll finally get it there. But it's going to help all, all everybody, kids uh, in the community that had trouble struggling this year with the virtual. They may finally have the uh, fiber they need. And that's sort of our responsibility to get that out. 
So in the process of doing some of this, we haven't allocated the additional funds to education at this time. You have the 6.2 million, and that I know that extra 5 million would be a 1% basically pay increase uh, across the board, what it equates to or close to it. Uh, and at this time we, you know, if we allocate that money, what programs do we cut to keep that money ongoing in the county? And that's the decisions we've had to make. Where, you know, if we give that extra five million to the Board of Ed, what, what aren't we going to fund? And that's kind of where it came down to. And we tried to give, spread it out right now. The one-time funding, I think, is gonna change a little bit till we get finished with it. Uh, it's, here again, that one-time funding is like carrying jello in your hands. We don't know where it's gonna wind up. And uh, we see this extra money coming in I'm going to be one, I tell you, I'm going to advocate to put a few extra dollars into uh, next year, into the budget coming up, but we have to find out where we are in that whole process first. And we have some, we still have a lot of unanswered questions uh, coming up here and uh, with the different funding, how it's allocated, and like you said, every penny we get from the federal and state has restrictions on it. We can only use it for certain things. And uh, this extra money coming, I don't know what the, how it's going to uh, play out, but uh, this is a, a very difficult year, and I I emphasize with you uh, empathize with you what you're doing uh, to try to make this all work. It's uh, very difficult, and uh, Superintendent Locker, you've done you and your staff done a great job, I think, of taking what is given and making it work. And our school system, our kids are going to benefit from it, but we're going to try to see how this plays out in October we'll have a better idea on everything at that point mr. Kiley and thank you Commissioner Weaver and we feel your pain I hate to depress everybody but if we all close our eyes and think back 18 months to some of the plans we had for this school system and for Carroll County in general that we got cracked about and we can't do anything about it except prior to all of us uh, prior to most of us, um, the employees in this system lost some steps and lost some stuff, and we had great plans to try to get them back. And I just want to make sure to piggyback what Ms. Savigny said. If, if you trip over a couple million dollars between now and the end of the budget, whether it's, we'd love ongoing, trust me, but if it's not ongoing, we'll still make sure it goes to the employees, correct, Dr. Locker? That's, that's still the plan, whether it's ongoing or one time, that's where it's gonna go. And that's a very powerful statement. I, uh, I'm glad to hear that. That's one thing that was asked in our deliberations. Is it all going to employees? And that's a, it's a much easier sell because we tried to focus on employees this year. And you know, we, we still have 600 county employees to deal with. We have uh, you know, 250 police and uh, uh, detention center employees and all these others we have to deal with here too. And school employees look to us as, uh, for a lot of those funding. We're, we're highly aware of it. Ms. Battaglia. Um, Mr. Weaver, I do, and I do wanna thank you for giving us a, a nice explanation and breakdown on how everything's gonna go through the budget process. Um, we had talked about the new emergency uh, unit coming into the county. Most of those departments make their money from carnivals, correct? Do what now? Most of the fire departments, they make a lot of their money off their carnivals. They're independent. They raise their own funds. Okay. So with them, and I know with, especially with COVID, we haven't been able to have any of the carnivals or anything. So I know that they lost a lot of funds because of that. Um, so I guess one of my questions was going forward, with the county funding EMS and our fire departments, are they gonna continue to have carnivals? And if so, what is the plans with the money that they each individually earn? They are, as an independent fire departments, we, uh, this is gonna be a joint uh, paid and volunteer program. E as they make money, that's their money to do with as they feel fit, and they usually use it to buy uh, you know, breathing apparatus, uh, fire trucks, uh, all kind of things, $800,000 pieces of equipment and apparatus that they need that they uh, fund through fundraising at that. 
uh, we're only going to fund the EMS, uh, the first part of this, in over maybe 20 years, yes, it may take off, but that's still their fire department, that's their station. Uh, they are community-based organizations, and we hope that they continue doing exactly what they have been doing for the communities. We're not trying to take that over, we're just trying to assist them to get in, getting people out uh, on that ambulance or that fire truck if they need it. And that's why I'm kind of a proponent dual certified people coming in. They're EMS or EMTs and a fire, firefighter certified so they can fill in if needed. And uh, you're probably not aware right now, you know, if ambulance shows up and they don't need them, if they're dual certified, they have their gear with them and they go fight a fire. Mm -hmm. And um, it's a world I really have gained a lot of education in about in the last several years, but uh, those independent fire departments will stay independent fire departments. Mm -hmm. right. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Dorsey. Commissioner Weaver, I too wanted to thank you for sharing the predicament certainly that um, the commissioners find yourselves in as far as meeting the needs throughout the county, um, but certainly as our board, we have to advocate um, for our staff and for our students. And certainly we have to point out that we really are supporting our employee compensation with any additional funds that we are um, going to be given, hopefully. And, you know, again, I know you know, as a former educator, you know, what it's like meeting the needs of a child in a, in a regular um, situation. But, you know, we're going to have our students returning um, to school life from a year that no one could have ever imagined um, in the past. So we know that there are going to be a lot of needs and we're certainly grateful for the grants that the staff members have applied for and that we've gotten. And we know that those funds are being earmarked. Um, but again, I, I just look at the extra load that it's really going to place on our employees to really meet the needs of the students. Um, they've done a phenomenal job. In fact, I don't know how they were able to do it this year with teaching the two models at the same time. Um, but throughout the system, you know, we've had people who really worked hard um, to, to get us to this point. And we just know that, you know, we're going to have certainly a lot of challenges up ahead um, with meeting the needs of our students. So the, the additional funding um, certainly is needed um, to, to show our, our employees that we do value their work, we value what they're doing, we know that it's tough, and you know, we know that, that they're willing to do it, and we just want to certainly show that we appreciate what they're doing. Um, and again, tied into all of this is that we know that we'll still be looking for um, teachers and other staff members to help support our system and that whole retention of staff and going out and um, you know looking for other staff members and then retain retaining them it's just very important and you know it, it's a challenge so any funds that we can have that would certainly raise our compensation for our employees will certainly um, be beneficial and again I'm not discounting any of the other areas that you've um, mentioned earlier but just know as our board we certainly advocate for our employees and for our students understood thank you well mr weaver i guess i'm the last one <laughs> to advocate but i am uh you and i worked together for 38 years and i am disappointed i really am uh we wanted that five million dollars for our employees uh we have we did the you asked us to do a five-year plan we've done that uh, and then to not be able to get that back and not be on our schedule we need to get that back so we can be on on schedule again and the other thing that i will reiterate is uh, when don and i ran many many years ago <laughs> believe it or not we did work really hard to work with commissioners and you all stopped meeting with us and we need to get back to that um, I needed to explain to you why we needed that five million. And there wouldn't have been a question. We would have told you all that that would have been for our employees. And I thought those meetings were very beneficial. We wanted to meet and we need to get back to that. And you all did not want to meet. Um, 
Uh, I, I think that will change here very shortly. Thank you. Look, our employees have been out on the front line. Uh, Carroll County Public Schools has led. We are, as the word, envy of the state. We have gone through everything possible, and things have just worked out wonderfully, and people are looking to us to continue on the correct steps to, to get through the final uh, part of this uh, pandemic. Uh, this money will go to our employees, and our employees, the Carroll County Public School system here, is your best advertisement in Carroll County to get people to move here. We are your best advertisement. Please don't forget that, and I hope that you all can step up to the plate and at least give us a little bit more. Dick, we go a long ways back, and our kids and our teachers, all of our employees are so important. So, and they great. really worked very, very, very hard through these difficult times. And uh, I can't thank them enough that the people are here and for everybody else that they have just gone above and beyond their duty to get our kids on board through this horrible pandemic. So I'll I hope- I'll bring this up tomorrow during Priority Carol and I'll bring it up again when we get back to the budget. Yes, I, I mean, then there would have been a lot of unanswered, there would have been a lot of questions answered that you didn't have. Dr. Dr. Lockhart. Sure, thank you, uh, Ms. Herbert. Thank you, Commissioner Weaver, for your uh, comments there. And I'll echo the sentiments of the, of the board members. I'll also add um, that obviously the future is, is important in terms of that five-year plan. And so we appreciate the, that looking in the out years that you've built in, that consistent funding for Carroll County Public Schools, and we're gonna, we're gonna count on that to continue to be there for us because we're, as educators, we're planners, you know that. Um, and um, and uh, having that consistent uh, revenue as we plan and think about the needs of our system and how we incrementally and carefully and thoughtfully uh, implement over time, that's really important to us. So we appreciate you including that in the next several years of the budget and look forward to that, that revenue commitment from you as well. So thank you. Uh, let me just, if I may, a moment here. Uh, we do have some bright spots perhaps in this. Now, income tax is our second largest uh, uh, m source of money coming into the county. And with all this federal and state money coming in, that may not drop off like it's been anticipated. Now, we never know until we get it, uh, what the state's gonna give us, but that may be uh, much stronger. It's, came, it's been coming in stronger than we've ever envisioned here at this point. Plus, the other aspect is, you know, um, property values have gone up tremendously in Carroll County. Uh, you put a house in the market, what, it takes 10 minutes to sell, I think, now, or something, but, uh, <laughs> Yeah. Those property values and assessments will be going up, which uh, has maybe a source of funding that we haven't even thought about here yet or we won't know about. Uh, so that may offset some of those uh, gaps down from 25, 26, and 27 and start to lower them so they're manageable. So those type things, and we don't have to change the tax rate uh, on that because assessments are automatically uh, going to change it, and I think they're assessing South Carroll area this year, I believe, and that's usually our largest uh, assessment area. So uh, it'd be interesting to see how that comes in. That may provide the funding that we need to continue. And Commissioner Weaver, I want to personally thank you, and I'm along with the board that you come to to our meetings. I want to thank you also for that. Well, thank you. I, uh, that's part of the obligation. Yep. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Dorsey, I got so caught up in the compensation piece, I forgot to get to my next thought, but I too certainly support our collaborative meetings that we had held on a regular basis and certainly look forward to the times when we, when our two boards can get together again. Thank you. All right, I think that's for the good of the order. Any other comments? Well, thank you all for watching and then this ends our budget workshop. Good thank you for all the hard work. Thank you. Thank you. You all have a very good evening, and thank you all for coming.